lecture tonight uh, to present. And just before we start, I'd need to do the usual housekeeping thing. So if you have a mobile phone, can you please put it on silent or switch it off? And if you are putting it on silent, we'd love you to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag APDL lecture. Um, we'll be allowing an opportunity for questions at the end of tonight's lecture. Um, and if you're not comfortable using a microphone, you're welcome to tweet your question and we'll ask the question for you. So um, we're also rec audio recording tonight, which we've been doing for the rest of the series, and we make those uh, audio recordings available via our Vimeo channel with uh, the slides accompanied. So if you'd like to catch up on any of the other lectures, you can do that. Uh, just check out our Facebook page, which is SLQ APDL. And um, if you have any problems being recorded uh, as part of the question section at the end, just let us know, uh, and we'll make sure you're deleted or something. From the recording. <laughs> okay, so um, I'd like to invite Peter Skinner uh, to introduce tonight's speakers, Stephen Guthrie and Lindy Atkin from Buck Architecture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Good evening, all. Um, yes, thanks. University of Queensland School of Architecture is very pleased to, to um, um, sponsor this talk series. And it's, it's a varied talk that we've had a series of international speakers. But what I'm really interested in is the speakers that are talking about the work that they're doing in Queensland at the moment in regional centres beyond Brisbane. And, and I think this night's talk will be fantastic. Uh, we're having a, a, a national architecture conference here in a few weeks' time, and a lot of people around Australia have got a very strong idea of what Queensland architecture is, Queensland contemporary architecture. And a lot of it is based around architecture that's been happening on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and so, you know, uh, Institute of Architects gold medalists uh, like uh, Gabriel Poole and Lindsay and Kerry Clare, John Mainwaring, uh, a whole school of very distinguished practitioners on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, the two speakers tonight come to the Sunshine Coast but from a, a non-parochial background. Uh, Steve Guthrie, uh, born in the UK, uh, grew up in the Bahamas, studied at the University of Tennessee and RMIT before finishing at UQ. Lindy Atkin was born in Sydney and she studied uh, at the University of Queensland and then went to London and worked with Nicholas Grimshaw, with Future Systems and with Richard Rogers Partners. So then the two of them came together on the Sunshine Coast to start Bark Design and, and they've got uh, a really interesting um, body of work. Uh, and when you look back through the back catalogue you realise that Steve and Lindy were working for Lindsay Carey, you know, Gabriel and John Mainring and all those people. So it, there's a real sort of wealth of talent and it's, it's so lovely to see the next generation of, of really exciting work coming from the Sunshine Coast. So I'd just like to invite Lindy Atkin and Steve Guthrie to the stage. Okay, mic's working? Yep. We've, we have a few things just to read for a few times during this uh, talk, but most of the time we'll be uh, tag-teaming. But first of all, we'd just like to uh, say thank you to Peter for your introduction and for your invitation for us to speak and your generous writing about some of our work over the years. Uh, thank you also to UQ and to Asia Pacific Design Library and State Library Queensland for supporting this lecture series. And thank you all for coming along. It's great to see so many familiar faces. They said this mic was a very sensitive one, I'm sorry. We just have a technical issue. Well, we'll use the arrows. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are fortunate to have been able to make a, a practice in a beautiful place and have enjoyed um, working with a fair share of stunning sites and great clients over the years. Lindy and I will talk with an, a fairly informal tag team approach as a fairly casual discussion about our practice and some projects focusing on our process, sites, and also clients' stories. This evening, we'll, we'll try and share the context of the practice and the context of the sites, our projects and local culture, and also the ephemeral and real edge conditions and thresholds between interior and exterior of the projects. We love the Queensland coastal environment and the benign climate in which we live and practice. Um, it allows us to explore ideas of outdoor living, strategies, and architecture which spring from the context, often with reference to the strong lineage of coastal vernacular of the Sunshine Coast. And central to our sphere of concern as architects is the notion that engaging architecture and urban design is that which focuses on the human experience at, at its core and how people are connected to their living work, learning and leisure environments, rather than being disengaged from it. 
Uh, Peter has highlighted our background before starting Bark. The lineage of our practice on the Sunshine Coast results from respect, mentoring and knowledge held for and imparted by John Mainwaring, Gabriel Poole and Lindsay and Kerry Clare. On the Sunshine Coast, Steve worked with John Mainwaring for four years and I worked with both Lindsay and Kerry Clare and John Mainwaring and we met while we were working in John Mainwaring's office. We subscribe to both international and site-specific design ideals contributing to the Australian coastal vernacular. We are in our second decade of continuous practice, having been working on the Sunshine Coast as Bark for 15 years, starting in 1997. Since about 2000, we have been a team of between five to seven people, including many UQ, UTAS and international students and graduates uh, who started their professional practice with Bark. Our client base is particularly diverse, with a majority coming, whether permanently or on holiday, from outside our region of the practice, as shown on the client context map, global map. Our clients come from all of these places in the world. We haven't got any projects in those places yet, but they're all coming here to build in Australia, particularly in, on the Sunshine Coast and in Queensland. Introducing them to place through design process seems to be a common occurrence in our design process. The coastal contacts map shows projects on the Sunshine Coast and Queensland Coast, which spread between Byron Bay and Mission Beach in North Queensland. The majority of our projects over the years have been private houses for individual clients on a diverse range of sites and locations, with some small commercial and a series of civic projects. If we can get this um, automatic slide changer working, it would be fantastic. <laughs> Uh, in preparation for this talk, we realised that we've now amassed 75 built projects. With the projects to be discussed the evening, this evening threaded continuously along that 15-year period, 15 year period, we've chosen to uh, work through a few projects in a chronological order. We'll talk only about the built projects and finish with some currently under construction. Um, as is the certain reality of practice, there are probably as many or more unbuilt projects. And to give a broad background of our ideas of context, we'd like to start by sharing where we live and where Bark started. So, this is a, a series of projects we'll be talking about this evening, starting at the top left back in 1998, um, and finishing with the three um, projects currently under construction. Um, Some of which we'll just briefly talk about others of which we'll go into a little bit more The initial project is the split wedge house, which is where we live now and is surrounded by forest edges and also uh, provided our studio space for the first three years of Bath. Um, the project is primarily about re relocation and recycling of a timber house. Um, Look at this. So basically... No. Try again. Okay. This is the split wedge house down here, very densely bushed. This is our studio, and that's a project that we'll talk about next door. This is a lovely ridge along here, which is Sunrise Road, which you get some fantastic views. It's, a, it's all about 15 minutes from um, east of Noosa Heads. Um, so this, this is the house that um, was relocated. It's a 1940s post-war house from Tawantum. Um, and it, it, the imperative was it was economical, it also had a, some history attached to it. It had generous three metre ceilings and, and fantastic, fantastic wooden floors. Um, and it was really about um, relocating a suburban house onto a rural site. Um, economy was the, the main driving factor and it provided instant livability. And the, I guess the main difference between where it was in Tawantin and where it is now is. Is the privacy is no longer uh, a requirement. So over the years, so over the years, it, it's been a a, a great um, project for experimentation. Um, being timber, it's very flexible, and a, a lot of the work could be done um, ourselves. This was the um, primary concept for it. Uh, because of the size of the house, it had to be transported in two pieces. So. Rather than relocating the house on the site back together again and trying to stitch it up, the, the two halves were left apart and um, the internal breezeway was sort of inserted between. So the, That's you can the split wedge down pretty the middle much see the two halves of the house um, with the internal breezeway. 
Um, this, this diagram shows it a little bit more clearly. Um, I guess the, the insertion the, there. The, the problem or, or the opportunity we saw was really the Queenslanders and, and similar building stock are fantastic at the edges, but they're usually dark and lacking ventilation on the interior of the plan because they usually, just because of the nature. So it was trying to invert the veranda and putting a veranda on the inside. Um, and I guess the main thing was introducing a, a dappled light and shadow similar to the feeling um, of being in the forest, being um, really trying to connect it to the site. Um, this image um, has resonated with us for a number of years. It, it was originally brought to our attention by Jerry Murta through a postcard. Um, and it's a, um, a 1931 uh, photo called Pagola Pattern by Harold Sersnow. And it has been an image that... Um, Harold was the founder of the pictorialist movement in Sydney in the 1930s, and this new type of photography at the time was seen as a way of projecting an emotional intent into the viewer's realm of imagination. Um, and as I said, every time we think of what we're trying to achieve, we come back to that image just because of the, it, what it evokes for, for us. Um, so the permeability and dappled light found beneath the for, forest was the, the, um, the primary um, idea and how it fell. Okay. So our approach to designing buildings is with respect for the site it rests upon. Um, working with the natural landscape and the local microclimate to unlock the spirit of the place. We aim to identify a clear strategy supporting, supported by a rigorous site analysis and always functional basis to design decision making. We aim to bring clients on the design journey with us um, and Bach was from that, from that house we were uh, formed when we won an invited design competition for the design of the Calander Art Gallery. So we were working from that house for, say, the first three years. We never had client meetings at the house. We always went down to the Council of Caloundra. Um, so this project, we, we won this project by an invited design competition. And um, if you can just have a look at the context there, it is quite close to Central CBD. There's a lovely park. Well, that's Bullcock Street, the main street. Bullcock Street, CBD. There's this Pummelstone Passage and Bullcock Beach. An esplanade. Um, there's a, a civic precinct here, which is basically a council theatre, uh, council administration office, and um, a library, and a post office here, and also a, a park which link. So uh, the site we're talking about is here. The site was actually originally gifted to council by private landowners, and one of the conditions that it was gifted was that we needed to, or they needed to, keep the sacred paperbark trees on the site. So. You can see them just on the right-hand side of the gallery there, um, and also the, the civic um, precinct. Uh, the building was a, an existing building, which you can see the L shape, and then the new insertion, which we had to refurbish completely, a new insertion was this sort of Alto-esque shape, freeform, uh, fun reception space on the top. So again, it was a, a reuse and kind of recycling project, so it was about taking the 1970s L-shaped building, stripping it right back to its essential structure um, to, to form the basis of a flexible series of gallery spaces. So essentially, this is the existing building, um, series of gallery spaces, the new uh, reception and entry space. Um, the, the program actually required a Category A um, gallery requirement, which um, includes controlling moisture, temperature, lighting and security uh, for a controlled situations so that it will enable the gallery to attract and, um, and host national and international exhibitions. The uh, main thing about it, well, you can see on the right-hand side, the existing building, we basically stripped the whole ceiling out, polished the existing concrete um, floor and then the new insertion on the left. Um, this was a series of um, movable walls um, and you can just see in this series of slides how that design idea translated through construction. would have been great to keep the natural light but not in a Category A gallery. And then the final space before they started to put the exhibition up and then with the, the walls all in place and the artwork in place. There's a series of slides here that just show the, the functionality of the place for different events and activities. The main thing was that um, the, it would 
create a, um, a place that people would want to go because it's, it's a fun building from the outside and you can see activities happening inside through that threshold of the reception. That's what the building used to look like, which was a pretty sad state. And then the, the interiors. And then from the, well, the, the steel, just a couple of really fun shots to show how the skeleton of that steel structure worked. And then the view from the inside and then a couple of views from the outside. And I guess the, the uh, fabric of that space is really everything that had to be there in terms of structure and, and um, enclosure. You can see the, the um, patterning of the, the vertical columns and the translucency changing from the sides uh, echoes the verticality of the trees. Um, the, the name bark came from really the, the skin of a tree, um, more of an envir environmental um, connotation. And the skin or bark of a project is the edge or the line of enclosure that uh, we are most interested in in the work that we're doing, um, where the relationship between the building and the site is the, the strongest. Um, our design agenda centres around the process and the experience that the projects enable, reveal. Um, light and shadow, lightness and anchoring, volume sequence, construction to place, um, inextricable land. Uh, connection to landscape and um, usually an overriding uh, legibility of construction. Um, the success of the gallery project gave us the impetus to actually, well, and the confidence to start our own, um, make our own building, our own studio at workplace. Same slide as before, that's the Split Wedge House. This is now our studio on the ridge on Sunrise Road with some great views to Noosa. So basically Noosa heads itself is that little spot there, and then that goes through Sunshine Beach, Perigian, and Coulomb's just off the page. Yeah. So the, the, the contextual conditions were really um, on the ridge overlooking um, the coast. Semi-rural site with 50 metre frontage and, and lots of um, flora and fauna, um, and the broad views. Um, we wanted to um, increase the street presence, so um, locating the uh, office between two existing bloodwood trees was really important. And I guess the key ideas of the, the project were testing an alternative practice model that is a contrast to the usual urban office tenancy. Um, right, I'll just walk you through that quickly. You can probably see it anyway, but the street is down here, then the entry platforms, and then a big open volume with uh, six workspaces along here and reception there, services on the south, and then a meeting space at the end, and then upstairs... Um, above the library becomes another library and sleeping space with a bathroom for end-of-trip facilities. It's essentially, the, um, the project was thought of as a, a veranda space. So we work in a veranda, um, and that is the glass box, and all the storage and all the books and everything are located in the plywood box, which faces the street. So and mo modularity is a big uh, key influence in our work as well. So this whole facade is based on um, standard size plywood panels, five panels high and four panels wide. And, and the plywood um, was a repetitive material in terms of the ceiling, the floor and, and the cladding. So quite an early model um, actually on the site. We didn't end up building the downstairs part because the, um, the root system of the trees were just um, <coughs> too extensive. You can see here we've got the four footings which the whole building sits on, then these two rails, which all the loads come down onto, so you've got a 3.6 cantilever, and five, a series of five portal frames that went up in about a week, and then the final skeleton before we started having the skin or and the bark put on. And there was a case of infilling the steel skeleton with uh, um, traditional um, stud frame construction. So again, we've got a, a series of um, photographs that we'll just go through fairly quickly. Uh, this is the northern end, so, as you can imagine, this whole wall faces east, so we have uh, internal, uh, sorry, external blinds that come down, not in this photograph, but they come down on the outside of the glass so that it contains the glare and keeps the hot air out in the morning. Um, nice and neat workspace, it's not always like that. <laughs> and upstairs in the library, um, you can see we're fairly rigorous with our organisation, so... I guess the, the other thing to mention, which I don't think we have, was that the, the building was really intended as um, whether it could be a small residence or, or a studio, so it really needed to be flexible enough. So if the whole studio thing didn't work, 
we could strip out the furniture and it could be a, a really comfortable place for a, for a couple. And it has a street presence, which is what we were looking for, so that people, if they like the building, they'll stop and say hello. If they don't, then that's OK. So that was really uh, our billboard um, and the shop front window, which is um, essentially our, our merchandise or our models. And, um, We've been called a coffee shop, a cake shop, a real estate agent, you name it, and people don't guess what we are in there. <laughs> I guess one thing to mention before we move on is that Sorry. we were very keen to... Um, it's, it's one of the few places on Sunrise Road that you can actually drive along or cycle. It's a big cycle uh, route, so you can cycle along and actually see through this site to the view. Um, elsewhere, there's lots of fences and a lot more vegetation, but mm. um, we were very keen to um, keep that going. So the sort of boundaries are fairly blurred to the street. OK, we're off to, uh, off to the beach, but... Um we often work with a design premise that the site holds a lot of the clues on how a design can come into being and be part of its place and character. We search the site to understand its spirit, the distinct character of the place. From physical site analysis, we are observing things in order to discover design solutions, which will provide occupants with a connectivity to their place. We will continue with our first house for private clients. Uh, the next project is the, the Marcus Beach House and it's a house which is on the edge of a tree in that um, it's a house that wraps around a, a beautiful Moreton Bay ash. It's situated about 250 metres from Marcus Beach. Um, it's very it was a very tight budget and the uh, interesting thing about this project was we started in 2003 for a young couple um, just starting a family and actually revisited the project uh, seven years later with a semi-retired couple who had kind of different... Um, they bought it. Mm. They bought it and um, they just wanted to just uh, upgrade it slightly to, um, to suit themselves. Um, so there's a large Morton Bay ash in the middle, which is probably about 50 years old. Um, the whole idea was to actually... And it sits right in the middle of the site. There's the site boundary around there and the tree is smack in the middle of the site. So the first sort of move we made was say that's staying and we're going to put a pavilion on either side of it. There's also a sewer that runs down this side so we couldn't build too close to that boundary. And that was a, just a, a classic a, a cliche as it might be, drawing in the sand with the climb on site saying well this tree's magnificent, there was parrots in it, why don't we do two pavilions and it was... Let's they do were, it. Yeah, yeah. They and um, to incorporate some double height volume to get the, the subtropical sort of breezes through and get the heat out. Um, large overhangs, obviously. That you'll, you'll find that we've got a few of these slides that are um, site analyses. Um, but, yeah, so from a programmatic point of view, the street's up here, entry boardwalk. So your point of arrival is very blurred. You don't just kind of walk in a front door. You're kind of in-ish here, but all those doors are stacked open. Uh, essentially, the whole back pavilion is uh, living spaces and the front pavilion and bedroom above, main bedroom, and then the front pavilion is garage with kids' bedrooms or guest bedrooms above it and the bridge link in between. Everything in green is actually what we added new uh, in the second phase of the renovation. So the second phase was really um, cosmetic and it, it, it enclosed a, a, an outdoor bridge link. It, it um, made the beach shower definitely a beach shower and it also um, provided a, a laundry which in the previous design it was just open. Um, roller doors basically. Roller doors. And no enclosure between the uh, garage and the living. Red was a, a real theme that was threaded its way through this project. In the renovation, you can see it's gone. <laughs> Pretty. And that, that was really in, this, re, really in response to Seamus. The, um, I think he was the, probably the three at the time. Jelly bean doors. He used um, to look forward to every time he'd get to the next hole. <laughs> uh, and there's the series of the red elements. Red in the kitchen, red in the jelly bean doors, red on the wall, red on the, the bridge. They went, and it got much more calm So this down. is um, how it is currently. Um, you can see that the bridge link um, was enclosed on the ground level and the, the landscape um, has um, developed mu much more. The main outdoor space is this. Um, Owen, the owner, used to call it his office. He was always there when we went and visited <coughs> internal spaces and then the enclosed bridge link through. Uh, halfway landing, a little reading nook. I guess that's the diagram of the, the two pavilions but with the circulation around the courtyard. So you're always looking back into that space. 
and the shadows cast through the tree onto the polycarbonate, which just um, provided a delightful light inside. And the stair tower um, As a lantern. becomes a real lantern. So at the, um, at the same time, actually, that we were designing that house, uh, the next house is in Harvey Bay. It's just a classic shot of Harvey Bay. Uh, suburbia, completely different, hardly any trees relative to the rest. They're all, they're all new. Uh, north is straight up on most of these. Uh, when we first started building, there was hardly anything there. So again, the site analysis, north being straight up, the views being 180 degrees across, um, then the central spine wall along through the middle there. But because you've got these amazing views, you've also got these fantastic winds that come up. You can see them from there. They're not, they're not breezes, <laughs> they're gales. So in the back, we introduced a courtyard so that you could still see through. So the essential diagram was two pavilions separated by outdoor living. Um, with a covered deck and, a, and an open courtyard open to the sky. Um, and the courtyard wall just gave that sense of privacy from a kind of an encroaching suburbia that was surrounding. Uh, again, quite a tight budget, but you can see that it's quite a different, a different solution to a completely different place. All of the main bedroom and living dining down that end, and then all of the bedrooms this end, and that's the open space in between. Um, so, similar to the studio, this, the structure of this house was a series of steel portal frames that, that um, went through the plan. So um, speed of construction, um, the initial phase anyway, was really quickly, really done quickly. It was our Christmas card in 2002. We actually photoshopped the red on. <laughs> um, but the finished building, as you can see, it, very rigorous. I, I think the photographer did an amazing job not to get suburbia in these shots. It's... <laughs> You can just see it creeping through in the back. But um, a, really, uh, a really fantastic client who was very open-minded and very collaborative as well, filtering the light, a lot of these ideas. And the courtyard looking through, so you're not compromising the loss of view. Uh, so, yep. so the next project, we heading back towards Noosa again. Um, and this is a public project, which is your classic uh, dunnies. <laughs> all, all architects need to do a good set of dunnies. Yeah. Um, this, this we've called the Noosa River Amenities, and it's on the edge of a river. Uh, the green zone is essentially Nooseville foreshore, which went through revitalization uh, back in 2004. And um, it's just an amazing stretch of... Um, public land which is just really well used. Um, so in terms of the initial site, I guess what we we're trying to get in this building was a framing of the river, of the place that you arrived to um, use the facility. Um, and uh, A view approach, right through to the, the river mouth. A, approaching that from a series of um, dividing the building bulk into two elements and actually framing the river on arrival between the two and respecting the, the existing fig trees by tilting the roofs up to them as well. So that was the essential section. Um, separating the roof from the enclosure so it really floated and, you know, the, the building, I guess we were exploring it in terms of the most permeable screen that you could with privacy that, that was required. Uh, programmatically, it was just the, the female on the left, um, wheelchair accessible, and then male on the right with the ambulatory. But the viewing platform is actually really successful. A lot of people just sit there and wait, and they feel quite comfortable sitting right in front of toilets. So, um, a few technical things that we had to do. They had problems with other toilets, apparently, where people were climbing up. So we've got all the battens spaced very close at the bottom so you can't get a foothold and then it opens up to allow for the ventilation at the top. So th the point of that was really just to say that the, the form of the building was from a functional point of view and in then, terms of the climbability. And with the exposed studs, this is kind of harking back to the, uh, the local vernacular of, of you know, the Queenslanders with their single skin exposed studs. Uh, timber was a real challenge trying to get it through council just because of the maintenance side of things but they've all agreed that it's actually a fantastic response and they haven't had any graffiti whatsoever which is great and it's just so much warmer warmer timber and spotted gum which is local as well so you can see the context right opposite the, uh, the boat hire place 
So under the large canopies, there's a, a steel mesh, so you know the the ventilation is um, straight through. And then this is the access view from arrival, and then opening right up, so you can see the, the Noosa head, uh, sorry, the Noosa River mouth there, across Massoud's jetty, which is always packed with people fishing. And at night it glows, so it's a 24-hour facility. And the little building on the left is um, one of the boat hire places. There, there are quite a number of them all the way along the edge. Um, and that's just an example of some of that rudimentary coastal building that we love to um, look back to, I guess. Uh, going out to the hinterland now. Again, uh, this is Tinbirwa Mountain, which is our local mountain lookout. Uh, right next door, again, the same slide again, but this time we have the what we call the Noosa Hinterland House and Studio. Uh, this client actually came to us after he had bought the land sight unseen and um, didn't realise we were architects next door, knocked on the door and said, you know, <laughs> any chance you could design us a house? So uh, it was an ideal scenario, except that they were living in London and we didn't actually get to meet his wife until they were about to start construction. So our studio is down here at the bottom, north again is straight up. There's two pavilions, one is the, the main house, the other one is the studio. And there's, the challenge here mostly was to make sure that we provided ample privacy for them and that they didn't overlook us too much either. The, the reason for the studio is Stefan's a painter. A, quite a good painter actually. Um, just does some really beautiful works and extensively. His, his partner Adrian is a fine, a fine arts person. Uh, fairly steep site, so you can see to keep under the height limit, we really had to stagger it all the way down the hill. The bottom pavilion is the studio and the top one's the house. And our studio is to the left here. This is the uh, arrival point, entry kitchen living all downstairs, uh, and then art studio even lower, and then all of the bedrooms upstairs overlooking a double height space. It's also tricky with this roof. Um, we've got a tilted skillion so that when you're standing on the upper deck, you actually are looking along the same plane as it rather than on the roof. These are our client. They're our neighbours too. They've so become the fantastic two, friends. The two little ones weren't around when the um, house well, was designed. Oh, they were. She was sitting around um, a builder's yeah. exam at nine months pregnant. So. <laughs> oh. Oh, I think I skipped one minute, just didn't want to go forward. Uh, so, yeah, long section through, you can see the, the living spaces all along here. The library, which is a really intimate space, and it, it, it sort of closes down to the studio end, whereas down up to the northern end, it opens right up, and the pool is here as well. Bedroom upstairs and the gallery all overlook the double-height space. So the, the budget was fairly tight, so in terms of floor area, it had to be kept fairly compact. Um, so introducing a, a double-height volume really assisted in... in Getting the, they both lived in New York, so they, they love the New York loft feel, and uh, we, we're also big fans of connecting spaces vertically. Uh, so this is a relationship on the street between our studio on the right and then the house on the left, and the the building vernacular has a very sort of similar physical form, but the materials are quite different and the spaces are quite different. Again, spotted gum on that western facade. You can see the sort of beaming up Scotty steps at the entrance there and just it's to... A, it's a real undercroft so now um, we can we basically look out of the studio and you can see the boys playing under under the undercroft as, as in many Queenslanders they've got a couple of swings and hammocks and mm. um, it's a lovely activated shady spot um, those paintings are Stefan's there as well. Uh, the other thing is that we knew about all of the furniture they'd collected from various places and so we knew exactly what pieces to put in different places and same with the light fittings and everything. So it was a, you know, they've got the Batoya chairs and Adrian actually designed that dining table. Um, they built these leftover things, uh, so, uh, furniture out of leftover decking. So in terms of its compactness you can see there that the living, dining, kitchen deck is all one, one space um, and connected to the bedrooms above in the bathroom so we knew they had this me suite and we put it right next to the bath so that they could be sitting next to one another there again the, the bathroom and the <laughs> the bathroom and the bedroom sort of open open up to each other similar to a, a hotel a little, little yeah. bit of luxury for them Stefan does choose some strange subjects for his paintings sometimes I think the worst one though was when he was doing a meat series and we ended up with so much meat left over from his still lives <laughs> For the dogs, you know. <laughs> so this is the, the northern end of the, the house, so it's got the plunge pool, the, the little um, silver art box to the left, 
um, and the main bedroom deck above. So it's all, in terms of outdoor area, they're all gathered at the front, which is at, at the north end, which is completely private from, the stu from our studio, so. And you can just get a glimpse of the studio here, which we're just about to go down into. Um, this, this room is um, um, super um, modular again with the plywood. Um, it's a long, thin space, um, pretty much proportioned for painting. Stefan um, gave us the proportions in terms of what he, that was, how it looked. It was, um, had a very clean floor, but it's not anymore. But this is def, uh, facing dead south, so you don't get any direct light except for very early in the morning here, um, and then the northern facade. Yeah. That's pretty much the view we have from our studio. So at night time, the thing lights up, and it's just like this little chapel over there with him walking up and down with a paintbrush. He gets mm -hmm. into a fairly rigorous zone when he's, when he's painting. Uh, so looking at the view from that space, and we're about to zoom into Noosa Sound, which is over here. So that's the Noosa <coughs> Hill National Park. Okay. Um, oh, visitor information centre. I thought we were going to Noosa Sound. Sorry, we missed one. Um, the, the Noosa Sound house is on the edge of a river. It's a re reuse and renovation there, yeah. project of which uh, one, of, one of many um, alterations and additions. Um, and it's for repeat clients who have done about six or seven projects now over the years. Um, it's, it's 1970s reclaimed land, and when it was first released, it was selling for about 10 or 15,000 for a block. Now it's upwards of two, three, and four million for the same site. Um, so the site is facing south there and looking across to beautiful, lush, sort of verdant bushland. And what we, what we came across is a, a 1980s rendered double brick built to the maximum site cover box um, with a truss, truss roof, so extremely low ceilings on the ground plane. All the bedrooms were on the ground, living was upstairs, so it was really disconnected from the kind of idea of river living. We did actually do a scheme on knocking it down completely and starting again from scratch, but um, the client was just a bit altruistic and decided that he didn't want people starving in Ethiopia while he was knocking down this perfectly good house. So we ended up with uh, an alteration of additions. Um, the jetty's here, the river's there. Um, we have, basically it was a big, I guess, 20 by 20 something, a metre squared box. We basically completely gutted the middle of it and then took out a, a double height space and took off the existing roof as well. So the, the early design discussions with the client about actually taking away floor area um, were a little bit tricky, but um, they um, soon began to realise that the, the volume that would happen in, instead of the extra floor area was mm. of major benefit. They ended up with a smaller house, but with higher quality of spaces. So you can see there the double height space um, connecting the upstairs and the downstairs and just giving a lot more relief to the, to the height. And, and flipping the living downstairs, you get a much better connection to the river. But also, it made sense of the 2400 height ceiling. So there was a real contrast between uh, volume. So in the kitchen, which is on the left, and the living on the, on the right, you just have a more compressed space. And then a bridge link up across the top um, allows you to be able to see across from side to side and, and have that connection to the river from the back of the house or the front, depending on which way you look at it. Uh, this is the main bedroom deck, which um, they use a lot for yoga, so they have the um, privacy. You can imagine a lot of people actually putt around on the river and just privacy is a big issue. Opening completely up to the south. It's actually much nicer looking out to the south on the river because you don't have the glare that you have on the north. Um, but the seamless threshold was a really important um, element and also to get some timber in there which didn't require maintenance being on the underside of the ceiling and opening up the kitchen. Very robust floor finish, and quite a again another lantern at night. Uh, stand up paddle boarding is huge up there at the moment, um, and so is this, of course. So we're off to the beach. And um, Hastings Street, um, a project on Hastings Street, which, if many of you know, is pretty much would be the lifeline of the industry of Noosa, which is tourism. So um, this is Hastings Street here. This is Main Beach. We were just over on the Noosa Sound, and our little building is tucked in the corner of the surf club. Um, the, the purpose of the building is for an information centre, so visitor information centre. Um, it was a very small footprint, but it needed a big presence. So it was about 135 metres of side area that was allowed. Basically, that's the enclosure there. 
Um, and the issues to deal with there were a three-storey surf club building on the northern edge of this, this project um, and also extending the footprint of it as much as possible. So the, the three-storey surf club was here right on the north and we were supposed to have a single-storey building. So the first sort of thing that we did, the gesture that we did, was say let's lift this roof right up so that we can actually get some natural light down through there and give a bit more of a civic presence in terms of scale in front of that building. And there are a few ideas that without the first one obviously was to get the light in, the second one was to actually get the view up to the vegetation, the third one is to get a dappled light into the space, and then the fourth one was to have a, a, a sort of a fairly uh, freeform type roof, which was like a canopy, a, a leaf canopy, or a if leaf. you like. Yeah. Um, again, well, that's sort of basically the enclosure line is here. Uh, front of house is that extent and then you have back of house but we really were striving to get an absolutely sort of seamless connection and threshold to Hastings Street so that people didn't really realise when they were actually arriving into the building they, um, they just found themselves sort of inside all of a sudden and you can see the, the type of light we were trying to get onto the, um, onto the floor through that high level clerestory window uh, the brochure racks were take up a huge amount of space and also storage uh, <laughs> so the building ended up looking pretty much like this blue and yellow are the, um, the signature colours of information centres so they were given they were so kind of keen to get that branding in, yep. into the building um, but you, again you can see you know, all of the doors just stack completely back um, one thing that was part of the brief from council was to include 2% of the uh, contract sum for art and so we put together um, an expression of interest document for artists to um, say how they would interact with the building. In this case, the successful artists was um, Wendy McMahon and, and uh, Wendy Brooks and Kevin McMahon, um, who proposed to actually engage with the space rather than just applying a surface texture. So these proper girls, they called them, were um, like from the mangroves that like make their way down the river and then just plant into the into the uh, sides. So you can see a couple of the significant trees, which. You can be, um, you can enjoy through the class tree. And, and that was an opening day, but it's it's quite often as busy as that as well. Uh, this <laughs> this is Main Beach. The next slide is our next site, and it's completely contrasting. These series, <laughs> of, this, the series of random slides, are really just to give you an idea of. Um, what's in our, in our client's perif peripheral vision when we're going about these projects. In context. But the difference here is that there's just no people. You know, it's, it's just in the middle of nowhere. Beautiful neck of the woods up at um, Agnes Water, but it's a place called Sunrise at 1770. Uh, Michael Meyer, who's the Meyer family, um, one of the sons, uh, developed this whole land. He reclaimed it from a mining lease and then um, de designated about 90% uh, of it to conservation. The building that we're just going to quickly show you is here. There are also central facilities around here, and we've also done a house here, 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 and this one's under construction. The, the, the nature of the site is almost that um, you really shouldn't be building any buildings in there. Um, it's a national park sort of thing, so... It's really well maintained. Any that, approach has to be really um, careful in terms of um, topography and... and um, not dominating the ridge line from the ocean. Well, that little dot there is a flag where we were testing to make sure that the house didn't actually break through the roof line. Roof That's line. also um, a turtle nesting um, colony along there, loggerheads and green turtles. So light is a critical thing that you don't have any lights facing out to the beach. Uh, it was quite a big house and the site was quite big, but again, view straight out to the east, so you've got that climatic control issue um, but so we tried to open a lot of it out to the north. Whoops, a bit quick. Uh, you're arriving at the top of the site and then moving down right through, hugging the land, if you like, to the, the main bedroom and the main living and then guest rooms in the middle. Uh, you can see the slope there. What we're trying to do is just hover above the ground. And the turtles actually come right up and nest underneath, you know, right up to about here. So you've just got to be so careful with lighting. Because they go the wrong way. Yeah, because they run towards the light, basically. They generally, they'll try and hatch on a full moon and, and run towards the, the, the waves on the edge, which are usually white. So the, the fabric of the house is um, a lot of spotted gum, which is left to silver off over time. Got a f fairly casual character. 
Although we did use Bloodwood floor because they're a client from Jersey in the UK and they have all oak over there and they are so over blonde so we had to use this red floor when they discovered it. We would never know would you do that. But, <laughs> um, but you know, fabulous outlook. Um, they're here for three months of the year and then back in Jersey for the rest of the year. Again, hugging the slope on the way down. You can see this is the context to the water. That's all turtle nesting area. And then looking from above, Red Rock, which is the house under construction, is tucked in there. Okay, the, the Mullaney house is the next project we'd like to talk about. Um, it's on the edge of an escarpment and um, a remnant rim of the Glasshouse Mountain Range. So we, we also refer to the house as a Glasshouse Mountain House for some obvious reasons that you'll see. The site's a small uh, rural site along a steep escarpment. Um, it's immediately opposite a dairy farm and a macadamia farm. Um, Mullaney on, on the range yeah. is very lush and green. It's got high rainfall. Um, and the particular site's got amazing changing weather conditions from fog and mist to um, rain and, and just really crisp, um, clear, clear air. Um, the site's got incredible views to the southeast and down the coast to Brisbane almost. Um, but it's also got... Um, Southeast winds that really race up the hill pretty much 90% of the time. So the southeasterlies are just flying up this direction here, or probably from here actually more. So we've got very few outdoor open areas there, where they're more on the north, but you can see through. And so it was really um, Shall I just, uh, anchoring a, a, an outdoor courtyard which had access to yeah. northern winter sun, um, but still getting the transparency through a pavilion which you could enjoy the view. Um, these, the street it's located on, um, it has a buffer of a couple of um, great camphor laurel trees, but also it's a, a very popular motorbike Sunday drive. So, um, so this great big wall that we've put along there as a gesture is in plan here. Um, that's a rock a, gabion. A gabion wall in which the rocks came from the Glasshouse Mountains quarry. Um, so it really sets up when you're on the, the other side of the wall. Do you want to walk through the plane? Yeah. Okay, so um, driving in, you've got um, car spaces here and a double garage there, visitor space. You enter at this point here, and so you're open up to the whole courtyard experience. There's a completely separate wing, which is a guest bedroom and studio. Um, laundry was the best view in the world. <laughs> uh, upstairs to the bedrooms, and then this whole pavilion here is dining, kitchen, living, and outdoor deck. And parents above. So I guess that's another thing, is trying to achieve some clear separation in terms of zones. So um, the parents and the, the sort of growing teenage boys who are now at uni. Um. Uh, so obviously on the right-hand side, it's to the south, so we've got a taller building, but that cliff is just straight down. They abseil down it to control the, um, the privet and then the northern light can come down through into the courtyard space. And in terms of the experience, the, the house um, or the site slopes towards the east down, so on entry you're really um, anchored to the site with a lot of stone, and as you move towards the east it sort of tends to float. It's an uh, early model. Actually, we've got... Yeah. So that's the, the point of arrival. And then I think we've got a couple of photographs that show you how it panned out. So it's really um, a house around a lovely... Um, well, the main space in the house is the courtyard, so it's really an external landscape space. We went down to the quarry and chose those big rocks and they feature around the house. I mean, there's, there's definitely a, a nod to Japanese architecture there and there's always that kind of careful line that you don't go too far in terms of literal translation, but... Um, the connection between the two pavilions at the ground level. And looking back from the living space. There again, there's a lot of um, play with volume, um, compressed dining space, um, into, and there's a lot of seat elements and day beds which are sort of strewn around the, um, the outdoor courtyard, which provide that sort of social, intimate um, or social interaction. This client's actually um, from Romania. Uh, well, they're actually Australian, but they've been living in Romania for several years. And they're back here for a week and then back off again. Uh, 
Okay, back down to Sunshine Beach. And we're all over the place because it's chronological order, so I hope it's not too sporadic. This is but a the practice has been sporadic over the last 15 years. <laughs> yeah. so. um, this is the two apartments. There's a house that is um, just finished recently, and we also did two apartments down here called Blue Tongue near the surf club. But, yeah, so we're going to have a look at that one. So Sunshine Beach Main Road is here. You can see the cluster of shops and things, and the surf club is there. Um, site analysis, it really, um, because North is, is up on a diagonal, it, we, we decided we really needed to have them both two-storey rather than one on top of the other. They both have pools. Um, and so the, the circulation coordination was via a lift from, to all three levels and also to introduce a light well in the middle to get light right down into the middle of the plan. You can see that light well and, also, and roof decks as well. So they, they had a, a decent budget. Um, they're real estate agents and they, d they wanted to build these for uh, commercial, um, selling them on, and they've sold them both. They're now used for holiday rentals. Um, the interiors, I just put that there because the interior photos didn't have any, f any furniture. But the, the main thing was to have sort of separate identities. So that one, apartment two, has got its own identity. Then you have that void in the middle, and then the other apartment has its own identity as well. The view through to and from the entry. This was the apartment one, and apartment two, and the internals of apartment one. So the next project we'd like to briefly talk about before we conclude with a few projects under construction really briefly is the Sunshine Beach House. Um, it's a house for a Melbourne family. With well, this is our client, really. This is, this is the client. <laughs> um, they um, come up here, come up to the coast at every opportunity they, that they can. They've had a long association with the coast over the last 20 years, or their parents have anyway. Um, and it was a site that was close to the shops and, and a walk to the beach at Sunshine, but it really had no um, sort of... Out it's got five neighbours, basically, no, so there's no, no view. Mm. So in terms of the initial... Uh, or the key idea was to create an oasis within, um, and that's essentially done on the um, central part of the site via two double-height spaces, one internal, one external, um, and external. It, it provides a fairly clear separation of zones. Uh, via a timber bridge. So there's the two pavilions. The kids are back here with their own media room and then the adults are at the front and then you have the two double height spaces. Yeah. So it's similar to the Marcus Beach House just in its general uh, layout or um, experience. Uh, the roof former there you'll see in a couple of photographs is really to get light into the middle of the plan and also to the southern in end of the house. Um, we kept the pool raised out of the ground um, just because it was quite a narrow site and we didn't want to have then another space for circulation and then a pool fence. So it was really um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of FC, um, exposed uh, timber, um, a screen running along the northern edge, um, fairly um, easily maintained or materials that didn't require maintenance because they're away for some time. But essentially, the experience is that um, outdoor pool room. We um, we were engaged to select and design all the furniture as well, which was a pretty neat commission. So that's uh, walking across the bridge towards the parents. The other thing to, to just notice is a couple of these window boxes, which really provide that um, a nice intimate sense of scale if you want to retreat and go and read a book. Um, but the central double heights... Um, space that really provides that gathering for extended members of the family and friends to come together during holidays. Okay, last finished project is the transit centre. So we're leaving the beach and going into the busy junction, the Noosa Junction. Uh, the main street of the Noosa Junction is here, Sunshine Beach Road. Uh, the big coals thing is back here. That road leads to Sunshine Beach. That's all National Park up onto the, national, the Noosa Hill. This is all Wetlands National Park. So as, from an arrival point of view, it was really important for us to ensure that we integrated the whole transit centre with lots of vegetation and starting specifically from uh, a fairly wetlands end here, working our way through to a more formal kind of um, 
landscape arrangement in the shared zone. And that's, it sounds easier than it, it can be with state government clients who... Yeah. Um, they don't want trees because the buses yeah. can't see. And Bus operators don't want trees, you know, council, council don't want buses. So it was a real, there were two clients and it was really about meshing the, the two ideals, I guess. So the, effectively, the arbour which strings the whole thing together as a journey, which leads to Sunshine Beach, uh, and the little spaces off the side of them provide the places for retreat while you're waiting for a, a bus. The platforms are straight, almost straight out of the catalogue, um, translink shelters, uh, as with the driver's facility. So, so we were really interested in the middle bit of the project um, and how it could activate in its own right a place that you could be at the... Um, Junction, which is the main business um, precinct, and actually just go there for lunch or go there to meet someone. Yep. We, we're also actually seeing... Um, An English language school have classes there, which is quite good. But there's a series of little spaces, shaded sections, um, treed sections, seating against um, landscape here, and then this whole arbour kind of strings it all together. We struggled for a long time trying to convince them to do a timber arbour. They wanted to do a steel arbour, but you'll see in the shots that... So the, the timber arbour, luckily, was um, made from 19, uh, a 1930s Mackay Wharf. So it was interesting. It had a previous transport history, um, but it, it gives an amazing warmth and um, naturalness to the, that central space. And all of the, um, the street furniture as well, these seats are from a bridge just near Ipswich. So again, another transport project. Uh, and, and using the spotted gum and the exposed studs again for these ancillary buildings. Uh, the other one, one thing that we did have a win on was the TransLink shelters normally just have this acoustic or sometimes solid ceiling, but we managed to convince them to have a section which gave you light down on the bottom here with a really beautiful pattern light, and it was based on the pandanus leaves. So it just creates a, a really dappled space all throughout the year, letting natural light through there. The backpackers are the most of the people that use these, um, these shelters. And we're actually doing an extension to it at the moment for a minibus shelter, which has now become part of the brief. Um, eventually, though, this, the greenery will just come up and go all over this whole pergola system. Since these photos are taken, it's already started coming up. And just a, what we call a shade pod, the external seating and the arbour right through to the other end. Lighting was really important as well. We've got a series of random up and down lights, trying not to just put that lux level that TransLink requires everywhere. Um, and then that's the, the sort of the main arrival space at the end and in context from across the road and from the shared zone. So the three projects we'd like to finish on um, are under construction now. Uh, we've got just a few slides of each. Um, and the, the difference between the three houses is, is one is a steel, predominantly steel house, one's concrete and one's timber. So we'll start with the timber, the timber house, which is located at Pridgin Beach. Um, Pridgin Beach there. The, the lovely thing about this site is it backs onto a, a wetlands reserve, so, and it also faces north across that reserve. Uh, it's on a sand dune site. It's got a lot of lovely um, Morton Bay ashes and coastal vegetation, so... The initial sort of um, strategy was to really map that vege vegetation and try and discover some pockets within that that we could actually site some building for. You can see the shape of the trees because of their southeasterlies, and that's them on site. <laughs> so they're they're really formed by the um, the conditions. So I guess we were trying to respond to that further with the building. So it's a wriggler. It moves around the site in among, out amongst the trees. Um, uh, with a street view more or less like that. Um, and really setting the house back and setting it within the dune. You sort of arrive on the site, you go up and over the sand dune and back and keep going down. So really wanted to keep that sense of arrival and up and over the dune and sort of hug the bottom of the site. Um, the central um, room is kind of um, positioned between two wings for, for bedrooms. Um, it's really uh, what we call the Bahama Room. Ta -da. Is that timing? <laughs> uh, we've almost finished. Um, you can see the trees here. They're, we've had not to take too many limbs off at all because the surveyor did a really three-dimensional survey for us, which was great. Uh, the entry there, that's, that's at a later stage, obviously. 
and then looking out to that wetlands at the back. So that's all, again, spotted gum, recycled timber, so it'll uh, be weathering off to a natural silver grey to match the trunks. the bell. That was the bell. I guess in conclusion, uh, the projects we've selected to discuss this evening, probably too many, sorry, um, give a snapshot of the diverse coastal context and conditions of the sites, our clients, design ideas and resulting buildings over a period of 15 years. We hope we've shared with you our process and preoccupations and have communicated our approach to architecture and design as a work and life thing. Uh, we aim to maintain a balance between revealing the poetic experiential qualities of spaces within functional and pragmatic climate responsive solutions. Um, I guess the main aim for our buildings is to bring joy to the clients and for those, the, the clients' buildings uh, to make a valuable contribution to a continuum of contemporary architecture um, on Queensland, Sunshine Coast and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Stephen, Lindy, for an absolute masterclass in, in design. <laughs> we might just have a, a, a little discussion. We've probably got about 10 or 15 minutes, Cess. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm glad that there's so many students here because, because I, I just think there's a real lesson in there about architecture and, and how to make it. Uh, we're having a conference in a couple of weeks called Experience, and I think looking at every one of those projects, I felt as, of, as if I was in the space. I felt as if I knew the landscape and where the sun was coming from and what it would be like to wake up in those spaces. And, and I think that's a really powerful thing. And, and the way you present it with the site analysis at the beginning and working very clearly with very clear plans and sections, it, it must, you know, I, I think it must be very convincing for clients when, when you come to them with that understanding of the site mm. and, and, and a, a way of working forward. Mm. I mean, do you, yeah, look, um, we quite often at the beginning, we spend a lot of time with clients trying to form a brief, um, extracting things from them. Sometimes we have 100 points of you know, answers of questions we've asked for. Um, we ask them if they can provide us with magazine clippings and books and all that sort of thing. But then we tend to just go away and... Put it aside for a minute. Yeah, it, it sort of simmers away in your head. But we're, we're always a little bit worried that we've gone too far with the design in the first stage. But in, in some respects, you kind of have to, because if you show a, a fairly kind of loose sketch and people aren't used to reading those drawings, then they don't really understand the idea. So we come to them with explanations of why things are in those positions and yeah. analyses. Yeah, and I guess the, um, trying to in integrate the clients with that process taking them on the journey of why things are like they are, and they are because of the site or the, because of this weather pattern, a crazy wind from the southeast, or um, wanting to uh, feel um, you know, sun on your back in winter. Um, whether you want to wake up with light-filled room or whether you want to wake up with total black. Those are all questions that we ask. So it, is, it has been a convincing tool in terms of the sun analysis um, informing the, the design and the clients going, yeah. yep. I think there's, there's two ways to, to really develop sophistication in architecture. A lot of people learn it from doing conservation work. So you work with an mm. old building that's been really carefully built and, you, and you're nervous about touching anything. Mm. And, and in your case, I think you're working on, on really beautiful sites mm. with, you know, with, that you, you, you need to understand and you've got to barely touch them to, to get the thing done. Mm. And that sort of pressure on you, I think, I think is a really good clarifying influence. Mm. And I, I guess even though your clients come from around the world, mm. the reason they're there is because of that love for that particular spot of the, of yeah. the earth. Oh, that's and absolutely. so that that's a, this must be the starting yeah. point for discussion. I guess that the point about them being from elsewhere is that usually we find in that early uh, design briefing process that we're actually briefing them about the place that they're coming to. So we're helping them understand why they've, um, what it is about the, those places that w we know probably a little bit better than them at that stage. Mm. And it's just a lovely presentation with a very evocative landscape. Mm. Hey, Christian, you got the you got the the Twitter working? Um, 
Want to? I might kick the uh, ball, get the get the ball running, kick the ball off. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm kind of interested, particularly in the consistency of your methods for site analysis over the years, over that period of time. Um, and there's a kind of intuitive sense uh, it's seen from your work when you are on on site. That, and I, I guess I wondered how much of the Partai diagram or the initial concept emerges in that first contact with the site um, through through that through that. Uh, body of work. Well, it's interesting, and I get chastised from Steve sometimes about this, that I always have to have a, a detail survey done first before I can put pen to paper. It's because things can be so uh, deceptive in 3D, especially if you've got a very densely vegetated site. You can't really tell the scale or the distance or anything. So, um, you know, you, you get a feel for a place, and you might have a particularly a concept with the uh, Marcus Beach House where the it just had to be. The tree belongs to the house and the house belongs to the tree in the end. Um, but, yeah, the, the detail survey is something that... I'm a very much a maps person. <laughs> so you get the survey before you do the site visit or the site analysis? No, no, we'd always go to the site first and we'd then ascertain exactly what needs to be surveyed. But um, really, before we actually start you know, sketching or mapping or anything, you've got to have the hard facts in front of you. And it gives you time to develop a brief with the client as yeah, well. I guess the other preset preset to that is that Lindy's father is a surveyor and her mother is yeah. a landscape architect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went through uni with mum when she was doing landscape architecture and I was doing architecture, so that's a bit of a symbiotic. Um, and she does a lot of our landscapes. So. But to answer your question, some of those, or m most of the early kind of um, diagrams do f stay fairly intact through the process. Mm. Mm. I always think that one aspect of Queensland architecture is just kind of frugality. I mean, if you look, if you look um, on the web and look at environmental architecture, you'll see, you know, strange swirling things shaped like a pineapple that is <laughs> is meant to, to be environmental architecture. But I guess in Queensland, th th there's always been a kind of sensibleness. And I mean, you were talking about um, ply sheet sizes mm -hmm. and getting the construction, you know, working. And I, I, I think there's something quite nice about the the actual architecture or the the fabric being. You know, simple and straightforward, and and not kind of laboured. So that the space and the light and the way people move, the views out, mm. you know, and the landscape beyond, it become the, the major major elements of that. Yeah, it's interesting because um, when Steve and I first met, and this is back in '95, I had come from that background yes. of steel and glass and you know high tech London. It was full on for six years. And Steve had come back you know, from a, an upbringing in the Bahamas and then working with John Mainering for four years and he was playing with sticks and timber and craft, you know. So you can kind of see in our studio the, the western side is the, the plywood and the, you know, the, the timber part and then the eastern side is all steel and glass. It's just, it worked for us. But, yes. but, <laughs> um, but I guess both of those systems, I mean, the, the British high tech mm. is very systematic and it's, it's very precise. Services, structure, yeah, yeah. very and, integral. And the Queensland tradition, mm. you know, if, you know, even down to the sort of pre-cut houses, was, was equally precise yeah. mm. in terms of the load that's carried. So it's, it's a nice marriage, I think. The good thing about modularity, yeah, <laughs> good fun. Yes. Um, yeah, the, the thing about modularity is it, it's not only sustainable because you're reducing waste, you've got less offcut and things like that. It's actually more cost effective because you're using all of the material to, you know, effectively have a larger floor area. Um, our studio is, is the, the floors of plywood. Uh, and it's eco ply, which you might know from New Zealand. Um, floors apply wood, the walls apply wood, the ceilings apply wood, um, and all the steel is very modular in standard lengths of timber as well. Mm. So timber joists. Mm. Mm. It's quite nice. Oh, yes. Oh, it, Lindy, you think you've just inadvertently answered one of my questions. Oh, okay. uh, I, I was um, going to ask you. You're always really clear about what architecture you want to make. That's something that's always struck me about you. You're really very clear early on about um, the type of architecture that you want to make. And I was just wondering about your background, and you've sort of you answered that in coming from um, uh, practicing early in your career in England and then coming to Australia. I'm just wondering um, how that's shifting and moving over time. I know you've shown a chronology tonight. Um, mm. Just wondering if um, you're still entirely clear about the architecture that you want to make? Uh, look, one of the things that, that was ingrained into my 
brain in London, particularly with Grimshaw and Rogers, was that um, everything, architecture, services, landscape, everything has to be absolutely integrally involved, and that means a lot of cross-disciplinary practice as well. I, I still think that's really important. Um, we don't have highly serviced buildings, so it's not always as, as critical, but we'd love to have a legibility of structure so that you can actually see how something's being held up um, rather than you know, we don't try and play tricks with visual forms or anything like that. Um, but, I mean, look, everything that you do, and, and we've worked with you um, before on the Shiriko, and, and you know what we're talking about is, is trying to make sure that it's just homogenous, that everything works together. Does that answer your question, Steve? Yeah. Well, look, obviously sustainability is a big thing, and I'm, I'm still sort of quite surprised when, when I was working with Rogers we were doing... You know, uh, I mean, and the whole of Europe was actually so far ahead just in the mandatory requirements for energy usage and things like that. But it's not a driving force in terms of um, designing to be totally sustainable. But we, the, the orientation and the, and the basic sort of um, layout and program of the buildings is something that is, as you can see from the, the site plans, driven by where the sun goes, where the rain comes from, where the wind comes from. Yeah. Can you answer that as well? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of, I didn't realise your mother was a, a landscape architect, but, yeah. but I mean, one thing that, that I really picked up tonight that I've not seen before because I've seen some of the buildings, but was the the, the, the Mullaney House because the the major the others are really sensitive with the landscape, but mostly by not touching it, mm. mostly by looking out at it, framing it, and so on. But at the Mullaney project, you actually had a constructed landscape mm. behind that defensive wall. And, and I, th I thought it was a really beautiful space. I mean, do, do you... Do you um, I mean, it's very, it's very difficult when you work in such a beautiful setting mm. to want to get out there and try and do better than nature. Yeah. <laughs> but when the setting's not so, so nice... Well, not so, you know, not so, yeah. so powerful. I guess with the Milani House, um, the view's amazing, but the, the south leaf can really be a pain. So it was really about um, doing that man-made space on, on the north. Um, and just trying to get a sense of the anchoring and the solidity and robustness that might be on, on the rock faces that we're uh, overlooking. We also had a really interactive client, very collaborative. He was fantastic. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of emails and Skype calls and everything and how many emails he actually sent with more inspiration about you know, ideas. So um, yeah. that, that definitely um, made the sequence of spaces... Uh, a little bit more interactive, I think. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a beautifully constructed landscape. It'd be nice to see more of that. Well, the tour's yeah. going there after mm, the yeah. conference. So. Yeah, sorry, just, I'll, I'll give you a plug, actually. We're having, <laughs> in, in a, a fortnight's time, we're having the National Architecture Conference in Brisbane. It's almost sold out. Uh, there'll be 1,500 people. Uh, but uh, Lindsay and Steve have also organised a bus tour to the Sunshine Coast, uh, which is available on Sunday the 13th of May, and there's still a few seats on that, so if there are people who'd like to see these, some of these buildings in, the, in mm. its context... It'll be um, the Mullaney House, our studio, and next door to our studio is part of it. Mm. Um, and Kerry Hill House, we Kerry Hill, yeah, quite a few, quite a few. So if, you, if you'd like a, a bus trip through, through Wonderland, it'd be very nice. I, I think... Okay. I, I can't think of anything more to say. I think it's just been a really wonderful, wonderful talk. It's just been, you know, I, I think it is a very precious part of the world, mm. and I think the way that you deal with building in it and framing it makes it even more precious, you know. And I think it makes people appreciate just how how special it is. Mm. So right. it's, it's a really lovely body of work. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <laughs>
that's a sold out event so if you have booked a ticket and you can't make it we'd really appreciate it if you could email us and let us know so we can reallocate uh, your ticket. Um, but there'll be urban design and architecture films run every Sunday afternoon here as part of the Slick Flicks program. We're also hosting a, an exhibition of unbuilt and emerging architects work in the design library which will be launched on the 7th of May, two weeks from today as well. So that, that's going to be fantastic. And we're also uh, hosting event, an event with The Edge this Friday, uh, Susie Bubble who's a fashion blogger. Uh, there's a couple of, I think, six tickets left for that as well. So if you're into fashion uh, and you want to come along to that, check out um, our Facebook and Twitter for more information. Um, if everyone can hang around for four more minutes, we have a short video on, I believe it's the Marcus Beach House um, from Bark Architects that'll kind of just wrap up uh, this fantastic presentation. So thanks a lot and see you next week. Oh, sorry.